So a couple of days ago, we put out a film about this new study that was looking at far-right echo chambers on YouTube, which strangely categorized rebel wisdom alongside people like Brett Weinstein, Sam Harris, Joe Rogan, even blogging heads TV as also far right. The good news is that the researchers have realized they've made a mistake. In an email to me, they apologized and said they would basically redo their research with new categories. And as I said in the last film, I don't think this was deliberate, but I do think that it flags up a huge problem that we've talked about before, the crisis of sense-making, the breakdown of sense-making, particularly in journalism and academia, failing to tell the difference between heterodox views that challenge the mainstream consensus and genuinely toxic. So, as I said, the researchers are going to change their categories. They're going to go with the categories that Mark Ledwich and Transparency Tube have used. He categorizes rebel wisdom as centrist. This flags up all sorts of issues with understanding what's going on in YouTube, uh, the issues with academia. So I thought I'd catch up with Mark Ledwich, the researcher, to find out what was going on. There is a lot of left-wing bias. In this case, I don't think it's necessarily that, or it's not conscious at least. Um, I don't think that they watch the content. They're just not f intimately familiar. So when they see the names on the lists, they're just, they're just text. They're not, they don't mean, they don't represent content that they're familiar with. So we also talked about how, even though he didn't think this research had been politically motivated, he thought some research in the past had been and had come to some fairly bad conclusions. They didn't look at people moving, being de-radicalized from the far right by any of these channels. They only looked at people going one way, but still concluded that it was a radicalization. It would be like um, worrying that planes are causing people to travel from Australia to New Zealand and only looking at like planes arriving in New Zealand, but not departing. It's just, it doesn't make sense unless they were actually, like you wouldn't accidentally do that. So I'm joined by Mark Ledwich. Mark, you created Transparency Tube. You've done a few different papers and reports about the political content on YouTube. You probably spent as much time as anyone looking at the political content, how to categorize it and what it means Let's start off by why. What, what, why are you so interested in this? Or what, what does the passion come from? I guess there's two reasons. One's fairly mundane in that I was looking to, for work, get into on the tools in terms of data analysis. And I thought a project on analysing the influence of YouTube on politics would be a good way for me to get my technical skills on a, a fresh project. Um, but it was also because... Uh, I read a fair bit and I listen to a lot of podcasts and I saw some of the studies that were um, claiming for some of the people that I quite like that they were a pathway to radicalization or pathway to the far right. And um, I thought that was um, not correct <laughs> to say the least. And I thought um, I could correct some of, some of the bias that's in literature and also do research in a way I think is better. So it's less, less paper driven and more software, more the type of way a software engineer would approach it. And we're talking now because of a, a recent report that came out called Evaluating the Scale, Growth and Origin of Far-Right Echo Chambers, um, which I became aware of because they categorized rebel wisdom as far-right, along with a lot of other channels like uh, Brett Weinstein, uh, Sam Harris, uh, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, and it was quite shocking to, to see that, quite surprising to see that. Um, and in a minute, I know that you, you've tweeted about this, and I think I talked about that in the last film, and you mentioned that there are some really interesting and, and positive things about this paper as well, like the way they've used data or the way that they've um, kind of delved more deeply into it than you've seen before. So we'll come to that, but, but let's start with what, what do you think's happened? How did they get this wrong? Because also we should say that your work they 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 used your work as one of the sources yep yep so um they used two other papers as um the source for their list of channels and their classifications it was ours and another group um uh, roberio manuel roberio i think was the name of the lead author and um they then like we had labels uh, 
that are quite specific. You can find them on transparency too. I think you talked about in your last video. Uh, the others, they had one small similar to this paper. They had an IDW label, an alt light, and an alt right label. And so they combine those two. I'm not sure exactly how they combine them, but that's some weird ways of translating the labels. So from from their paper, they converted IDW to far right. And from our paper, they converted anti-theist to far left, uh, social justice people to far left, and um, anti-SJW people to far right. So there's just a few examples of where they've classified people as far left or far right that clearly don't belong there. Why do you think that's happened? In this case, there is a lot of left-wing bias. In this case, I don't think it's necessarily that, or it's not conscious at least. I don't think that they watch the content. They're just not f intimately familiar. So when they see the names on the lists, they're just, they're just text. They're not, they don't mean, they don't represent content that they're familiar with. I think generally researchers, they, they listen to podcasts or they uh, talk on Twitter, but they, I don't think they generally watch YouTube. Mm. or any video platform. I think there's not much background knowledge with the people doing it for actually people that watch YouTube. For me, it's difficult to categorize in left and right. Like YouTube for me leans anti-mainstream. It's sort of anti-consensus, anti-mainstream, because in a way it is the, the place where perspectives that are not reflected so much in, in the mainstream will go. Like it's the, it's the natural niche for those, for those kind of perspectives. So I think it's really important to understand what's going on there. And in some ways, it's kind of more cutting edge than, than a lot of kind of mainstream media. But I think my sense is that people are coming with a set of pre-existing categories from a media environment that doesn't really fit with YouTube. What, how, how would you look at it? That makes sense to me. I see it as the internet decentralization of like knowledge sharing is naturally going to be uh, more independent than what we used to have, which is very centralized. Um, and YouTube in particular, um, it's actually trending away from that. So the fastest growing segment on YouTube in our um, list are, um, is the mainstream media. And that's partly because YouTube is recommending them much more than everyone else. Uh, and I think it's also because more mainstream people are moving to just watching their news content on YouTube as well. Yeah, do you want to talk a bit more about, just summarise some of the other interesting pieces that's come up from your research? Yeah, we found, we didn't find a radicalisation pipeline. So the idea that YouTube's a rabbit hole that you watch, like Tristan Harris would say, you watch a, um, a World War II video and then you get presented with a Holocaust denial video. That doesn't happen um, to start with. Holocaust denial videos are now banned, so you, they remove a fair bit more content than they used to. Still less than other platforms, but but more than they used to. Um, it definitely doesn't recommend you um, consistently down that path. So we found there's actually a mainstream, overall there's a mainstream bias in recommendations. So you're more likely to go the other way. Is it possible that that's changed? Because I know um, I've seen I don't know if this was data driven, but I've seen speculation that when Infowars was on YouTube, that because it, originally the algorithm was just recommending whatever they found to be the stickiest content, and the stickiest content for a long time was was conspiracy theories because it it hits people at a very kind of visceral level. Is it is it possible? I mean, obviously they're tweaking the algorithms all the time. Is it possible that things have changed? Yeah, they've gone through like I I probably put into three big changes. Um, Earlier on, it was the recommendation algorithm was pretty much directly based off the click-through rates of videos. So there was like the clickbait era of YouTube where everyone was designing their thumbnails to be the clickiest and they didn't have to deliver on it. They just they just had to have a really, really click-worthy um, thumbnail. And then they, they fixed that by having a bit more of a wholesome evaluation of do people keep watching this content? Um, and they also added surveys, which is how much you like the content after you started. So they got a bit more sophisticated, but they're still very neutral. So if like, so this is pre 2019. So before then, 
uh, there wasn't much bias, I think. There was very little thumb on the scale in terms of the type of content. Um, and then in early 2019, mid-2019, they started to really clamp down on what they call borderline content and promoting authoritative sources. And that helped mainstream media a lot because what they consider authoritative is institution. So do, are they a classical, what you think of classical media institution? Yeah, and this is sort of one of the tendencies that I was pointing towards in the last video is that the concern is that when like the new ideas by definition are coming from the fringes, they're coming from the margins, they're coming from like the heterodox challenges to the status quo is how we move forward. And the real concern and what I was worried about with this report is that it seems to be that for whatever reason, whether whether there's kind of bias among the academics or it's just generally they're not aware of the content, that there is a tendency to classify heterodox challenges to the status quo as um, either kind of beyond the pale, far right, reprehensible, or at least algorithmically bias it towards the status quo. And like the concern is that you just get this sort of ever narrowing f sense of kind of what's permissible and you, and you, by definition, you're, you're losing the good ideas as well as the ones that should be fringe. Yeah, that's definitely happening in general and probably a little bit in this paper, but this paper is by far not the worst culprit here. Yeah, there's been much worse. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> um, well, I think there was the, I think it was 2018, there was Data and Society's um, report Rebecca Lewis, which had, which was problematizing a lot of um, anti-woke types as being on the path to radicalizing people to the far right, and I, that definitely was had an agenda where they wanted to problematize people that went went left or they were anti-social justice. Then there's been other papers like the other paper that was used by the one we're talking about, and. That, that was looking at, it was trying to show that there was a pathway by looking at um, comments of YouTube videos and over time trying to analyze which way they were going. So they made their categories to try and get the pathway and then they analyzed movement only one way. So they didn't look at people moving, being de-radicalized from the far right by any of these channels. They only looked at people going one way but still concluded that it was a radicalization pipeline just to recap what they did was they they tracked people over time in which channels they were commenting on and seeing whether they went from um kind of let's say jordan peterson as an example and then on to more extreme content and they found that it did but they then they didn't they didn't do uh, uh any research into whether people had gone the other way yeah none none whatsoever so it would be like um, worrying that planes are causing people to travel from Australia to New Zealand and only looking at like planes arriving in New Zealand but not departing. It's just, it doesn't make sense unless they were actually, like you wouldn't accidentally do that. Um, and there's other little signs, like they called the, it, when someone moved that direction, they call it an infection. It's a very, very moralistic language as well. So what what do you think we do if if that you don't think was kind of solid research? What do you think we do know now? What can we say with certainty? Uh, we can say that um, the YouTube recommendation algorithm doesn't have a systematic bias towards the far right. We can say that. So it can debunk the the there's different rabbit hole theories, but we can debunk the mechanical mechanistic one mechanistic where it's the, the recommendation algorithm causing it. But people can get more sophisticated versions of that where it's the availability of content um, and the way people visit other podcasts and network that causes it or the way content is presented to try and uh, move people that direction. So I can't say for sure that doesn't exist. Or the, the large question, like if YouTube didn't exist, would there be less far-right radicalization? 
like a world without YouTube? Would that be would that be different? That's 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 really hard to answer. So, and that's what I thought this new paper was actually getting at, even better than I did, which is they used um, real web traffic data from a representative sample of Americans, so they could actually look at the real movement and the real use of YouTube, whereas so that that's like a much wider scope than just looking at the recommendations. Once they um, recategorize their channels, I think this is a really good way to get at the bigger, the more, the more holistic question of um, YouTube's influence on politics. So actually, the data set that they were using was much more comprehensive than most other data sets that have been used before. But the problem was the categorization by making so many of these channels far right, they actually kind of contaminated the, the, the data that they had. Yeah, it's, it's, it's better than other data sets in some ways because they're using real web traffic from real Americans. Um, whereas what we were doing, we have a much larger channel set than they do now. So um, we have over 7,000 channels, whereas they was looking about 900. Um, but we only have been looking at um, recommendations by YouTube. We, we don't actually know where people actually, um, how people are finding channels or their movement between them, we, we don't see that. So they would have started to answer some more questions. What research still needs to be done? What are the, what are the key things that you think, the key questions that we don't know that we need answers for? I think we need much more detail about how um, the platforms are influencing politics. So it's not necessarily it needs to be dramatically different, but it, there needs to be just lots of improvement and lots more understanding of how it's working. And I'm definitely not against regulation that um, would promote more transparency about the platforms. I'm a bit more skeptical about like further regulation than that, but definitely more transparency would be good. But barring that, like research like mine, we're, we're planning to expand it much, much further. So since the studies we've done, we've also started to monitor, uh, remove videos. So now on Transparency YouTube, you can see any video that's re removed and why. And then you also, we have the transcript for the video, so you can evaluate was, was, this comp was this removal in line with their content moderation policies or not? And these are things that are very, um, YouTube doesn't give much information at all about it because they they don't want to be held responsible for exactly how it's working. Mm. So we oh, yeah. we hope through our research to have like a really nonpartisan, um, kind of very raw data, good good interactive presentation of what's happening, and let a lot of the interpretation be done separately about what should be done or whether it's good or bad. Who are you hoping will use that data? Because, I mean, the issue is that if you do have a sort of systematic bias in academia, then people aren't necessarily going to be following that up. I mean, I can imagine someone like the Heterodox Academy or um, some of the, the more uh, institutions that are more kind of um, interested in ideological diversity and like um, heterodox thinking might be interested in looking at that. But but there seems to be a gap because academia is, is generally sort of trending one way rather than the other. It's really, really interesting working as an independent researcher because you're outside the normal um, status hierarchies and prestige pathways. So we have to try and get attention separately, a lot like you would for your podcast. We have to, we have to somehow get attention to what we do. So we find um, we use all the different methods so like I, I create conflict sometimes on Twitter to get more attention to the research we're doing that appeals to the more anti-SAW side of things but we also go through the mainstream institutions and get like we've been referenced in the New York Times twice we get referenced by Vox as well now because also targeting them with like press releases that they would be interested in so we're hoping to get attention through all tribes to basic data about what's actually happening and try to make it harder to bullshit, harder for people to tell the stories that they want to tell, uh, ignoring what, what the data is actually saying. Yeah, I mean, the only question that comes to mind, because you've been quite 
kind of open in this conversation about your kind of ideological priors. You've talked about like some of the um, part of the motivation was seeing channels that you uh, watch or sympathetic to being categorized in ways that you thought were a bit off. Um, the only question that comes to mind is like, as an academic in this field, are you worried about people discounting that because of your um, assumed ideological motivations? Yes, yeah, so that, that that's definitely happened. So um, when we released the paper, there was definitely um, a rounding of the wagons by certain journalists to call to discredit our study based on ideological motivations because they perceived where I was coming from, which was trying was bringing data to debunk the rabbit hole narrative that, that they're very much wed wedded to. Um, but to overcome that with transparency tube, we try everything we put on there. We try to be quite neutral and just matter of fact about the data. Um, so you can see that in the election fraud narrative data, there's nothing, there's no tone, there's nothing to indicate what we think about whether there is election fraud or not. Um, and I'm working with Sam Clark, who's definitely more on the left side of the spectrum, doesn't have that antagonistic, um, or he, he doesn't have the ide ideological priors that I do about being a bit more anti-social justice. So we can, that way, by being honest about our priors and having multiple people from different sides work together on a project that's explicitly neutral and purely about data, I think we can have credibility amongst different tribes at the same time. But we still need to, uh, if you're neutral in the way you present it completely, like by the time it gets to Twitter or by the time it gets into a narrative article, there will be ideological things added to it. Um, and that's actually required for attention anyway. So we do, we are pragmatic about um, getting attention to the research. That's but you'll find you'll find it used in both ways. You'll find it used against mainstream narratives and you'll find it used in ways for it. But we just try to make sure they're true to what the data is actually saying. So you've kind of come to the conclusion that you need some top spin to cut through. You need you need attention. And you can't get attention on the internet without some some being part of some narrative or some counter some narrative or some moral bent, some some reason for worrying about it or or supporting it or yeah, it, there needs to be a hook to tie you in and that's emotional right? and it needs to fit into narrative. So we hope we, we fit into that for attention, but um, we make sure uh, it's a it's respecting what the data and what's actually happening in terms of YouTube's platform and its influence on politics. The stories have to be true to what's happening. Yeah, and I guess that's one of the things that I've kind of talked about before. And like, I think one of the one of the failure conditions of traditional journalism has been this kind of affectation of the voice from nowhere. This kind of idea that we don't have any ideological priors. We're just kind of um, it's just the facts and everyone knows that there's always, everyone always comes in with certain perspectives, with certain biases. And that's the, one of the positives as well, I think, of, of the kind of YouTube revolution and the alternative media revolution is it's making that absolutely clear. It's making clear that there is a perspective that is not just solely um, detached and objective. I, th I think the way to deal with it is to make that conscious and to bring our ideological perspective into the conversation in a conscious way while saying I'm trying to transcend it and I'm, I'm trying to, like, this is my job. Yeah, I, the reason I choose the stories that I choose may be kind of part of my selection bias. It may be what I'm particularly interested in. But when I look at it, I will do the best to engage objectively and to look at both sides and to and to do do a professional job i think that's all we can do really and also to give people a sense that there are two things at work there's the journalist but there's also like good journalism has a set of practices it looks at it tr looks at both sides it gets a response from anyone that you make an allegation about it's accountable it's all these different things which is i think the difference between the two yeah i think you're right um 
definitely that that view from nowhere um that ideal is definitely not possible we can't we can't reach that so the next best thing is what you said the process around proper journalism let's call it truth seeking because i think academia and journalism are all in the same boat in that way yeah proper truth seeking you should um definitely try and be open about your priors and where you're coming from at least and then not be at least that way there's no disconnect between what's obviously an angle you're getting at and then the way you're presenting yourself like places like the new york times where we call it the paper of record but now like they clearly have a like a like a almost a far left wing bias on the opinion page so it's that disconnect which is often a problem yeah you've got to help you've got to think about helping your audience understand where you're coming from and then you're not deceiving them they can get a sense of where you're coming from and trust what your priors were coming into something and then they can evaluate it better when that's on the table mark it's been a real pleasure let's keep in touch and um see you soon awesome oh, thanks for having me our ability to make sense of the world is breaking down. We're making more and more consequential choices with worse and worse sense making to inform those choices, which is kind of running increasingly fast through the woods, increasingly blind. Over the last two years, Rebel Wisdom has interviewed some of the world's top thinkers. Now we've brought them together for an eight week online course, Sense Making 101, with Daniel Schmachtenberger. Diane Musho Hamilton, John Viveki, Doshin Roshi, and more. Improve your sense making, develop your sovereignty, and join a wider community looking to do the same. <laughs>